start recording. And will you please pray with me? Let us pray. Father God, we come to you this evening, giving you thanks, honor, and praise for yet another day that you've given to us. God, we know that every day is a gift. And Lord, we say thank you for this gift that you've given us. We ask, Lord Father, that as we go forth in this study tonight, that God, you open us up, keep our minds stayed on you so that we learn about your truth, your love, your grace, your mercy as we study your scriptures. We also ask God that we just study so that we can tell others about your goodness, that we don't keep this knowledge to ourselves, but we share it with people so that they know you like we know you and love you like we love you. For this is our prayer. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray it. Amen. 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 All right. All right. So let us look into starting our recap questions. And I'm just going to move everybody here. So in our last study, remember we talked about the trials of Christ. We also talked about Peter and his you know, problems that he was having and facing. So we're going to lean first with a recap question. And it says, true or false? The cock crowed three times, and that is when Peter denied Christ. False. 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 Yes. Why is it false? Because he crowed um, two times. He had crowed two times. Uh, Peter had denied him before the third um, time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Peter had denied him three times before the cock crowed. Gotcha. Yeah, you're right. You both were merging together. So perfect. Exactly. <laughs> and the reason why I put that up, remember, I was telling you guys on the last time that we have uh, a lot of sometimes we hear where people say, oh, the clock crowed three times and then Peter denied Christ. But it was three denials of Peter of Christ before the clock crowed. And actually, I just wanted to kind of look at those scriptures again. Will you please? Well, someone please turn to Matthew 26 and the 75th verse. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's read whoever has it. Oh, then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. That's it. Exactly, exactly. And of course, we have also that same type of account in Luke 22 and 61. So basically, it just kind of puts it in full circle. Remember, this is why we study. So we gain understanding and know what the word teaches us. Amen. Amen. So next, why did Jesus keep quiet when he was first questioned by Caiaphas? Was it because he knew the mission? Oh, man, I love it. Yes, that's exactly it. <laughs> that is perfect. Basically, you were right. He knew what he needed to do to achieve salvation. So he wasn't going to throw out his accolades. He wasn't going to puff himself up. He remained a humble servant leader and allowed them to just do what they needed to do until obviously Caiaphas charged him, you know, basically put him under oath. And that's when he spoke. But that is exactly it. So that's perfect. As they say nowadays, he knew the assignment. <laughs> Good deal. So next, true or false? Is the ancient world no? In the ancient world, Galilean was thought as an eloquent dialect, and many sought to speak it. False. 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 Tell me why. It was um, it was like a, a guttural type of dialect, and mm -hmm. they didn't really they uh, they thought it was. Kind of low class. Yeah, sloppy. It's like you got it. You, you guys are saying exactly the correct thing. Yes, you're right. A guttural type of dialect. Remember, it said there was recordings in by some of the uh, rabbis that they didn't want people who were Galilean to speak in church because they were ashamed, you know. And I and we can do it too. Obviously, in our traditional African American church, we don't want this person to stand up because they split verbs or whatever. But one thing yeah. I tell people is. The message of Christ goes out no matter Amen. what the word Amen. is. So Amen. if someone's up there and they have a little different, hey, you just cheer them on and you let God do what he does. Amen. Amen. <laughs> In Matthew 26 and 73, what gave Peter away showing he was the disciple of Christ? His accent. I, get, I tell you, you guys are on fire tonight. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly, <laughs> that is exactly his Galilean accent. 
So next, we just kind of look at an overview. Not this wasn't specifically to last night's, excuse me, last time study, but an overview of Matthew. And it says, in the Bible, what was Peter's occupation prior to meeting Jesus? Hmm. Was Peter a cop? No, 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 he wasn't. <laughs> I don't know. Somebody turn to Matthew, the fourth chapter. He was a tent maker. Hello, Mr. Jackson. Hello, hello. All right. And like I said, we got tent maker. We got pugging. Someone look to Matthew 4 and 18. <laughs> Where's my phone? Matthew. <laughs> 4 and, oh, he was a 4 and 18. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he was a fisherman. Well, read, read the text. <laughs> Oh, and Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, but they were fishermen. They were fishers. They were fishermen, exactly. See, it's, it's, it's not, not the point yes. we did now. We're digging back. Oh, he is. <laughs> I, I thought he was a fisherman, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, but now okay. I am. This is why we're here. This is why we're here. Hmm. Yes. Now, in our last study, Jesus came before two officials before he saw Pilate. Who were they? Annas, or was it Annas? Correct. And Caiaphas? And Caiaphas, that is correct. Remember, he went to Annas first. We see that in the Gospel of John, if I'm correct in that. And that opens up that conversation that Jesus first had with the ex, uh, you know, uh, high priest. Then he sent him to his son-in-law, Caiaphas, who is the current, you know, basically Roman uh, appointed high priest. And then, yes, we end up getting to Pilate, who we're going to get deeper into tonight, because that's where we left off in our last study. I tell you, you guys are ready tonight. This is good stuff. So <laughs> let us keep going. So in our last study, we left off by digging deeper into who Pontius Pilate was, because in our text, in our reading, Jesus was now before him. So let us get deeper into an understanding of this man. And will someone please read the commentary? Who was Pontius Pilate from Got Questions? Pilate no. Pontius was already bothering him when his wife sent him an urgent message concerning Jesus. The note begged him, don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him, Matthew 27, chapter 19, first. John's gospel offers some more detail of the trial, including an additional conversation between Pilate and Jesus. Jesus acknowledges himself as king and claims to speak directly for the truth. Pilate responds with the famous question, what is truth? John 18, chapter 38, first. The question intentionally communicated multiple meanings. Here was a situation in which the truth was compromised in order to condemn an innocent man. Pilate, who is supposedly seeking the truth, asked the question of the one who is himself, the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. A human judge confused about the truth was about to condemn the righteous judge of the world. Hmm, I tell you, that was well, that was well written. And I know Ooh. I'm biased because we as Baptists love to say the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But uh, I do, I tell you, I, I love that, how, how he wrote that. That was phenomenal. <laughs> uh, let us continue in the commentary. In the end, Pilate sought a compromise Knowing Jesus had been handed over by the religious leaders out of envy, he appealed to the crowds at the Passover, asking which criminal should be set free, Jesus or Barabbas. The leaders convinced the, cry, the crowd to cry out for Barabbas, Matthew 27, 20 through 21. Giving in to political pressure, Pilate authorized both the flogging and crucifixion of Jesus, wanting to satisfy the crowd Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. That's Mark 15, 15. Pilate had the charge against Jesus posted on the cross above Jesus. 
above Jesus' head. This is Jesus, King of the Jews, Matthew 27, 37. As soon as Jesus died, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus in order to bury him, and Pilate granted the request, John 19, 38. The last glimpse we have of Pontius Pilate is when he assigned guards to Jesus' tomb. That's Matthew 27, 64 through 66. Hmm. And to find out, I basically wanted to kind of show the full aspect and an understanding of who Pilate was. Basically, he was obviously a leader, but he was caught in a bad situation. You I mean, you almost have pity on Pilate, you know, basically because he was put in something he, he had to act on, obviously. Just, and that's unfortunately a, a part of leadership. But even in looking at this, no matter who it was, Pilate, another Roman official, whoever, the mission of salvation was going to go take place, no matter who the particular characters were, of course, in the story. So just wanted to kind of open him up a little bit. And, let's see. and we'll summon, uh, oh, okay, here we go. Pilate had the charge against Jesus posted on the cross above Jesus' head. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews, Matthew 27, 37. As soon as Jesus died, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus in order to bury him, and Pilate granted the request. Of course, the last glimpse of Pilate is when he assigns guards for Jesus' tomb. This is saying, Pontius Pilate's brief appearance in scripture is full of tragedy. He ignored his conscience. He disregarded the good advice of his wife. He chose political expediency over public rectitude, and he failed to recognize the truth even when the truth was standing right in front of him. When given an opportunity to evaluate the claims of Jesus, what will we decide? Will we accept his claim to be king or follow the voice of the crowd? <laughs> I tell you, so it leads us to our study question. And I wanted to break it down uh, into one and two. And basically it starts with, uh, why did the chief priests and elders of the people take Christ to Pontius Pilate over the governor? Take Christ or the governor, uh, because they wanted him dead, and they didn't have the authority to um, to crucify him or to kill exactly, him. Exactly, exactly. So here we go. You're exactly right. Pilate was the appointed prefect or procurator. In judicial matters, they possessed powers like those far more powerful proconsuls and imperial legates. In short, they held the power of life and death. And you were very correct, Mr. Hankins, and he's the one that had the control. He had the power, even though, of course, they had their Sanhedrin, that high Sanhedrin, all of these great uh, religious elect and religious individuals, they still weren't the ones that could actually give the condemning order to crucify Christ. Exactly right. Got it? All right. And of course, this is the second part of that question that says, what power did he have that they did not? And of course, basically pretty much answered that uh, as well. But I wanted just to go deeper with this. So will someone please read, why was Jesus taken to Pilate? The Jewish authorities saw Jesus as extremely dangerous, someone who had to be got rid of as soon as possible. Why exactly they believe this, we do not know. It is possible that they saw the event called the cleansing of the temple as an, excite, as, as an incitement to revolt. In any case, they decided that Jesus should be put to death, the most obvious charge being blasphemy. But only the Roman governor could order that a sentence of death be carried out. In matters of this kind, the death penalty was meted out by the Roman magistrate as sole representative of the imperial authority, the imperium. Moreover, Pilate may not have been interested in a charge of blasphemy, seeing it as a Jewish matter, and not something he cared to be involved in. So Jesus was charged with a different offense, high treason. This was something Pilate could not overlook. Just wanted to bring back in the mindset. Remember the last time in our study, we saw that they had, they were trying to trump up charges. Their big thing was he blasphemed, he blasphemed, but in the court of Rome, that was meaningless. So obviously mm -hmm. then they had to make him a rabble rabble. They had to make him a revolutionist because basically then his message was challenging the authority of Rome 
And that's something that Pilate could work with, or that's something they wanted Pilate to work with uh, in order to crucify Christ. So basically, high treason was basically what Pilate was saying, this guy was saying what Jesus did, versus the blasphemy piece that the uh, chief priests and, of course, the Jewish authorities did. So it answers the question, and basically it's kind of to get some more background to it. Only the Roman governor could order a sentence of death to keep, be carried out. In the matters of this kind, the death penalty was met by, uh, by the Roman magistrate as sole representative as the imperial authority, the imperium. Any questions or comments? All right. Let us go further. And now I just wanted us to revisit Matthew 27, 1 through 5, because it's going to open up a lot of different things about the text to us as we get deeper into this study. So will someone please read for me uh, the scripture, Matthew 27, 1 through 5. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. <laughs> then he went away and hanged himself. Mm, so we do remember this piece as far as in Judas getting so seized with basically remorse, basically it throws the money back at him. But remember they said, you did this. And why did they were they justified in saying that? Do we remember? Because Judas oh. went to them and <laughs> volunteered to give him up. <laughs> exactly. Right. exactly. Remember, Judas said, "What will you give me?" <laughs> they take care of him. Exactly. So they so they had him dead to rights in that aspect. Basically, he wanted to kind of say, "We all did this," and they said, "No, <laughs> you did you this." Did. <laughs> That's it. All righty, so let us continue. Uh, Matthew 27, six through 10. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, it is against the law to put this into the treasury since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Hmm. So we see basically a <laughs> graveyard for foreigners. And we've seen many types of potter's fields. I don't know if you've looked at any type of history, definitely in the South too as well, where we see unknown graves where they buried people, you know, who either died of an illness, obviously slaves that were buried in uh, mass graves and things of that nature, those types of areas, we see the same types of uh, representations of uh, potter's field. Not probably not obviously purchased in the same way, but it just gives us a mindset of what we were kind of talking about uh, in this. So let us go into commentary, discussing that ver those very uh, points. Will someone please read the commentary from Matthew 27, one through 10 from Enduring Word. was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver. Judas was filled with remorse, not repentance. Even though he knew exactly what he did, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Judas was more sorry for the result of his sin than for the sin itself. This is a huge difference in being sorry about sin. There is a huge difference in being sorry about sin and being sorry for sin. By throwing the money into the temple, the nail properly the inner sanctuary where only the priests were allowed to go, according to France. Judas wanted to implicate the priests in, his, in this crime, in his crime. 
it was his way of saying, you also are guilty of this. Hmm. So looking at what the commentary said, I basically want to look back at that paragraph A. And the reason why I want to look at that is because in our churches, we always talk about backsliding. We always say that Christ is married to the backslider. But what does that actually mean? What does backsliding mean? Sin. It's sin, exactly. What is that? <laughs> What it's is the decline, It's ahead. a decline from a spiritual truth. Oh, that, ooh, that was good. That's exactly. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> what, what, what was that? What was that? It's good. a decline from a spiritual truth. Decline from spiritual truth. Mm -hmm. I tell you, yeah, that one. And I, I can't, can't say nothing more to that. <laughs> <laughs> with, with, with that said, that's exactly. Because remember what we're saying. Remember that person who was backslidden didn't know who Christ was had a relationship with him, but decided to, in essence, as we say, backslide, return to that sinful nature. The reason why I wanted to bring that up is because in this, he actually brought up a great point between remorse and repentance. And sometimes we get those things overshadowed because in order for him, he says, yes, I'm married to the backslider. I want you to come back home. Obviously we open that up in the appeal, but that backslider has to be repentant, meaning that he or she doesn't just recognize their sin, but they are sorrowful for those sins. They are not wanting to go back. They want to go forward in Christ Jesus. So it's a great dichotomy that we see here between the remorse of Judas. He didn't want to repent. Lord, forgive me for what I've done. He just was so shaken up that they killed Jesus instead of through Jesus, during Jesus in prison. You know, it wasn't the tactics as far as, well, excuse me, it was the tactics and the actions, not basically the intent. Because the intent was, I want them to get Jesus out of here, you know, but I don't want them to get <laughs> So right. that's why we're really seeing this. And that's why I wanted to kind of bring that point up, because we still see that same point in churches today. You know, remorse and being upset about, oh, I did sin. But repentance is what actually brings us back into right relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what really is the important piece of it, because. We've had people who are going through something and they uh, recognize sinful ways. And in that moment of emotion, they're ready to kind of come forth, but still they don't turn back to Christ. They basically, in that moment, it's an emotional rush, but it's got to be where you are not just emotional, but giving of yourself. You look at that when Mary washed the feet of Jesus, those tears, just washing his feet, knowing her wrong, knowing her that who she was, and she wanted that true repentance, that true forgiveness for Christ, and that's what it's truly about. Does it make sense? Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any questions? Any questions? All right. Let us go forward in the commentary. Will someone please read? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. The act of a desperate man determined that they should get the money and perhaps hoping it might be a kind of atonement for his sin. All this happened seeing that he had been condemned. Perhaps Judas expected that Jesus would miraculously deliver himself from his captors. And when he saw that he was condemned, remorse seized him and he carried back to his fellow criminals the reward for his infamy innocent blood. Judas had been with our Lord in public and in private, and if he could have found a flaw in Christ's character, he would have been, this would have been the time to mention it. But even the traitor in his dying speech declared that Jesus was innocent. Hmm. I said, even the one who wanted to do all these things said, I betrayed innocent blood. So he knew, he knew what he had done and who he was dealing with. But still, like I said, it did not lead to repentance. Amen. Will someone keep going in the commentary? It is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. The hypocrisy of the chief priests was transparent. They did not want to defile themselves with the price of blood, even though it was a price that they themselves paid, went and hanged himself. It is unrepentant remorse and despair. Judas committed suicide, being the son of perdition. We are assured he went to eternal punishment. 
Some hold that Matthew's account of Judas's death is a variance with which says that Judas fell, fell headlong into a field, burst open in the middle and all of his entrails gushed out. Most reconcile this by suggesting that Judas hanged himself and then his body was cast down on the ground, bursting open. If Judas hanged himself, no Jew would want to defile himself during the Feast of Unleavened Bread by burying the corpse. And a hot sun might have brought on rapid decomposition till the body fell to the ground and burst open. Mm. So we see basically even the body, everything about that ending of Judas was not great, you know. And I, I like how they definitely uh, talked about it. So we see it when you read it in the text, you're like, well, I see it in Acts where he falls and bursts open. Well, how would he burst open? Well, it was basically after he hung himself and his body was sitting there rotting. Obviously, we know the gas is filled up in the body. The, it swells. You get rigor mortis. It's not a very pleasurable thing, especially if he was hanging from a tree. So, yes, if the weight of the body started to falter, yeah, it would fall and, of course, rupture. And we'd see these things. So that's why. So, And I think it wanted to be descriptive to say that in, even in death, it was ugly. You know about Judas. Everything about him was not great, was not great at all. So it definitely kind of brings that point home. Then was fulfilled of what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet. There's been much question about the quotation attributed to Jeremiah because it is found in Zechariah 11, 12 through 23. Matthew says the word was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, though we find it recorded in Zechariah. Some think it could be a copyist error. Perhaps Matthew wrote Zechariah, but in an early copyist mistakenly put Jeremiah instead, and this rare mistake was repeated in subsequent copies. Some think that Jeremiah spoke this prophecy and Zechariah recorded it, the words spoken by Jeremiah, but recorded by Zechariah. Some think that Matthew refers to the scroll of Jeremiah, which is included in the book of Zechariah. So obviously, remember, we see some, in essence, the people try to point out discrepancy, but basically it's just getting, gathering under, true understanding about it. And I like how he brought these three things to light, i.e. he, the commentary, uh, commentator, to kind of let us see what this could have meant in that text. Not that he misspoke, not that it was translated incorrectly, because we know that all scripture is inspired by God. Yes, men wrote as far as the text, as far as writing it with their hands, but it was God inspired. So we know that this is nothing that is a fallacy in the Bible, not an incorrection, but at least we need to highlight when we see these things and what it truly means. Does it make sense? Because I want to make sure we're clear with that. Amen. So let us go to study question 6A. What did the chief priests do with the silver pieces thrown by Judas? They bought the potter, the field. <laughs> bought the field. Exactly, exactly. They purchased a potter's field. All right. So I wanted not just to say, hey, the potter stood. I wanted to actually go deeper into an understanding of that. Now, like I said before, we see in our society now, we've seen where they have had potter's fields where, you know, they buried, uh, of course, I said slaves, of course, foreigners, things of that nature. But I wanted to kind of get deeper in the reference here in the, the text in the scripture. So will someone look at, well, will someone please read for us what is the significance of the potter's field from gotquestions.com? Uh, Akeldama, also Akeldama or Akeldama means field of blood in Aramaic. Akeldama occurs once in the New Testament in Acts 1.19 and is the name given to the place where Judas died. Matthew refers to this field in the Greek as the potter's field. According to Matthew 27.7, the priest used the money Judas threw in the temple before hanging himself to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Matthew also connects that Matthew also connects what occurred at Akeldama with prophecies from Jeremiah, Matthew 27, 9 through 10. The fulfillment of the prophecy in Zechariah 11, 13 is also explicitly connected to Akeldama. 
although Zechariah does not mention the Aramaic name. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the handsome price in which they valued me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them to the potter at the house of the Lord. Will someone please continue? Tradition is Akeldama south of Jerusalem in the junction of the Valley of Hinnom in the Kidron Valley. This Eastern part of the Valley of Hinnom was made famous by Judas, Matthew 27, three through 10 and Acts 1, 16 through 19. The Hinnom Valley is also known as the Valley of Gehenna. In the Old Testament period, it was where some of the ancient Israelites passed children through the fire. They sacrificed their children to the Canaanite god, Molech. Second Chronicle 28, 3, 33, 6. Jeremiah 7, 31 and 19, 2 through 6. Later, the valley was used for incinerating the corpse of criminals and unclean animals and to burn garbage from the city. Due to, due to these practices and the vivid imagery the place evoked, Jesus used Gehenna as a symbolic description of hell in Matthew 10, 28 and Mark 9, 47 through 48. Today, tombs and a large ruin that was once a charnel house can be found at Akeldama. The soil in the area contains a type of clay suitable for pottery, which is another reason it is designated as the potter's field. Mm, amen. Mm. First off, kudos to you, Sister uh, Hankerson, for those words. Amen. Phenomenal. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, 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 you did man. that. Just letting you know first and foremost. <laughs> but secondly, basically looking at that, it's just so funny how we see where this what this area that Jesus gave reference as into hell, things of all that. We see how this horrible uh, thing happened to Judah. You know what I mean? How they bought this field, how they used this blood money. It's just so interesting how the text puts it all together to let us know with in no uncertain terms that it was a very horrible thing. Judas died a horrible death. And of course, now this blood money was used to buy this place that wasn't great either. So it just kind of puts it all into uh, our mindset to really give us a vivid picture uh, of the text. Acts 1 and 19 refers to the field of Akeldama brought, bought with Judas 30 pieces of silver. The verse says that everyone in Jerusalem called that field in their language, Akeldama, that is the field of blood. At Akeldama, what Jesus stated about Judas became reality. The son of man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to the man who betrays the son of man it would be better for him if he had not been born. Matthew 26 and 24. So we definitely see, like I said, it puts it all truly in perspective. Amen. Uh, all so let's continue in reading the Holy Scripture. Uh, Matthew 27, 11 through 18. Will someone please read that for us? Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah. For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. Hmm. Interesting. So we see there were two Jesuses in this text. <laughs> <laughs> so we yeah, see yeah. Jesus the Christ, but we also see Jesus Barabbas. Very interesting. Obviously, that's why I put it in red. So let us actually look and investigate this man by the name of Barabbas. Will someone please read? Uh, please read the, that um, got questions for us. 
Barabbas is mentioned in all four gospels of the New Testament, Matthew 27, chapter 15 through 26, Mark 15, chapter 6 through 15, Luke 23, chapter 18 through 24, and John 18, chapter 40th verse. His life intersects that of Christ at the trial of Jesus. Jesus was standing before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor who had already declared Jesus innocent of anything worthy of death in Luke 23, 15. Pilate knew that Jesus was being railroaded and it was out of self-interest that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him, Mark 15, 10. So he looked for a way to release Jesus and still keep the peace. Pilate offered the mob a choice, the release of Jesus or the release of Barabbas, a well-known criminal who had been in prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder, Luke 23, mm. 19. Amen. All right, let us keep going, is going as far as in understanding this Barabbas. Will someone please read? The release of a Jewish prisoner was a custom was customary before the feast of a Passover. The Roman governor granted clemency to one criminal as an act of goodwill toward the Jews whom he governed. The choice Pilate set before them could not have been more clear cut. A high profile killer and rabble rooster who was unquestionably guilty, or a teacher and miracle worker who was demonstra demonstra demonstrably innocent. The crowd chose Barabbas to be released. Pilate seemed to have been surprised at the crowd's insistence that Barabbas be set free instead of Jesus. The governor stated that the charges against Jesus were baseless and appealed to the crowd three times to choose sensibly, to choose sensibly. But the loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified and their shouts prevailed. Pilate released Barabbas and handed over Jesus to be scourged and crucified. Mm -hmm. Will someone please continue? And some manuscripts of Matthew 27, 16 through 17, Barabbas is referred to as Jesus Barabbas, meaning Jesus, son of Abba, father. If Barabbas was also called Jesus, that would make Pilate's offer to the crowd even more spiritually loaded. The choice was between Jesus, the son of the father, and Jesus, the son of God. However, since many manuscripts do not contain the name Jesus Barabbas, we cannot be certain that was his name. The story of Barabbas and his release from condemnation is remarkably parallel to the story of every believer. We stood guilty before God and deserving of death, Romans 3.23, 6.23a. But then due to no influence on our own, Jesus was chosen to die in our stead. He, the innocent one, bore the punishment we rightly deserved. We, like Barabbas, were allowed to go free with no condemnation, Romans 8, 1. And Jesus suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, 1 Peter 3, 18. Amen. So we see basically there is a debate within obviously the ecumenical community, the theologians saying, did this manuscript really give us the understanding? And I'm to the top uh, to the process of yes, it did. And here's the reasoning and the fact that Jesus, obviously, we know at that time was a common name. You know, basically we see Jesus in our time too, especially in more Latin cultures. Jesus uh, is definitely a name as well. Mm -hmm. And I know we hear, we're like, oh, gosh, it's sacrilegious, but that's not. It basically was a common name. That's why when we hear Jesus, our Christ called, it's always Jesus Christ. Because mm -hmm. basically, remember, the Christ is, represents the Redeemer. The Christ represents salvation. So that's who we reverence, and that's who we worship. So in looking at that, obviously, yes, we could. he could have had the exact same name, but it even brings up a bigger question. Like they were saying, it opens up a whole spiritual thing. Do you want this Jesus, this man, this murderer, or do you want this Jesus, this Christ, this king? And obviously we see what the choice was made. So basically it really opens up our understanding to how abased the crowd was when they went for 
Jesus Barabbas. Why? Because they were denying the true power in Jesus the Christ. Does it make mm -hmm. sense? Yes. Cool. All right. And let us continue with the end of the commentary. Will someone please read? What happened to Barabbas after his release? The Bible gives no clue and secular history does not help. Did he go back to his life of crime? Was he grateful? Did he eventually become a Christian? Was he affected at all by the prisoner exchange? No one knows, but the choices available to Barabbas are available to us all. Surrender to God in grateful acknowledgement of what Christ has done for us. Or spurn the gift and continue living apart from the Lord. Hmm. Kind of a pretty poignant question. Obviously, we don't know the mindset or the thoughts of Barabbas, but we know our own. And when we are given a second chance, as Barabbas was given, and that's what God gave us when he gave us salvation, because we were condemned to sin and death. But because of the saving, uh, saving grace of Christ Jesus, we have that second chance to live life eternal with him. So it's just making the best out of what he has given to us, expanding upon that gift. And we see it throughout many of the texts in the Bible. Obviously, we talk about the parable of the talents, you know, where there was one who had five, there was one who had two, and one who buried his. You know, he was given one. And of course, the one who had five multiplied it to 10, the one who had two multiplied it to four, and the one who had one kept it you know, buried. And of course, we know what happened at the end of that parable where the one who had buried it was scorned. He was the, the master was definitely wrought with him because he didn't expand on that gift that he had been given. So it gives us cause to always appreciate what God gives to us and to definitely appreciate a second chance. Yeah. Any other comments? Yeah. All righty, we're going to end here tonight with this piece of commentary, but I wanted us to at least start touching on it. So will someone please read that and then we will uh, uh, talk more, end our session here for this evening. Now Jesus stood before the governor. History shows us Pontius Pilate was a cruel and ruthless man, unkind to the Jews and contemptuous of almost everything but raw power. Here he seems out of character in the way he treated Jesus. Jesus seems to have profoundly affected him. Matthew condenses the full account, telling us only of the second appearance of Jesus before Pilate. The first appearance before Pilate is described in Luke 23, one through six. Hoping to avoid making a judgment about Jesus, Pilate sent him to Herod, the sub-ruler of Galilee, Luke 23, six through 12. Jesus refused to say anything to Herod, so he returned to Pilate as here described in Matthew. Mm -hmm. So basically it just kind of shows us that there were was a lot to the story, that there wasn't just a singular interview that we see in Matthew, that the other gospels helped to kind of give us a true light in the questions that he was asking and how he was affected by Christ. I mean, it just could show this person who was this ruthless man, this guy who had authority, who had power, was just humbled by Jesus Christ. And basically, it just goes to show us how we can be humbled in his sight as well. You know, basically how Jesus just breaks us down. I mean, and when we get deeper into it, we'll see it wasn't anything that was so phenomenal. It wasn't a miracle that was performed. It was just his nature that actually was changing Pilate right before his eyes. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts, any comments, any questions, any uncertainty? You know, I, I think it's a good um, comparison or, or analogy, the way we look at, you know, um, how Barabbas basically stood in our place. I mean, how we can be, how we can associate ourselves with him, how Jesus took his place and, and went to the cross. And, and for us, he took our place, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's, it's just good how it, how it brings those things together. So you can see, well, that's, that's a good analogy of how Barabbas is kind of a symbol of us, you know. <laughs> Amen. 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 No, that's right. Other thoughts? I agree. Right. With sister. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I no, agree I'm, with sister. Go no, no, go ahead, please. I was just going to say that I really enjoyed this lesson and I learned some things tonight that I did not know. 
-hmm. especially after reading in Matthew. That's all. Good lesson. <laughs> that, that's what I was going to say too, Mom. Was that um, it's amazing how we have heard the story before, mm -hmm. but um, just studying it in more depth, and uh, it's really it was like wow. You know, there's so much that um, as you dig deeper, you learn more mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. it, and mm -hmm. you know. And so, yeah. So, thank you, Pastor. No, amen. Thank you. Like I said, it, it's fun to share because we all we all learn together. You know, amen. I had glanced amen. over the Jesus Barabbas before, but didn't really take the time to think about it and study it. You know, so no, it's definitely mm -hmm. definitely interesting piece. So uh, as I always say, if, if I'm not learning with you, then there's something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes, great lesson. Great lesson. Pastor, did you check your um? Yes, yes, I did. Actually, I'm going to uh, touch on it because I did see uh, in the chat where. Um, Sister Cindy wanted us uh, to some prayer tonight. <laughs> yeah, so I want us to go ahead and uh, get together. I'm actually going to stop the share so we all can see each other here. And I think we should definitely go into prayer. Remember, one thing we know that prayer especially is communing with God. That's number yeah. one. But we also can pray collectively together. Yeah. Sister Cindy, we don't need to know what's going on, but we all we need to know is that you have asked and we will. Amen. 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 And pray. Amen. Father God, we come to you this evening, God, just sitting just in this place, God, knowing that you are still God and that you are still in control of everything. And right now, we just want to put just a word of truth and a word, a word of faith in our sister right now. God, you know her needs, you know her desires, and you know what is going on with her. And we just want to pray for her right now. Yes, Knowing, God, that you said where two or three are gathered, there you shall be also. So, God, we know that there are more than two or three of us here, and we know that we are collective in mindset. So we know, God, whatever we ask, it shall be done. Lord, we understand that you can come in many ways as you bless us. You can come like a mighty rushing wind. You can come like a sweet, solid spirit, or you can just come individually and touch us. Whatever she needs and whatever is in our mind, God, Lord, touch her right now in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. And God, there might have been others who weren't as bold, who yes, need Lord. something in their yes, life, Lord. who need you to touch them and move in their lives. And God, yes, we just Lord. ask you right now to do the same for them. Because God, even though we are speaking over technology, you are a God that can move in every aspect. Yeah. You can go from Jersey to Ocala, from Ocala to Gainesville and to yeah. South Florida, wherever you want, you can move, oh God. Yes, and so Lord. we say thank you for that right thank now in the name of Jesus. Yes, and Lord you. God, we do not ask amiss, but we know we ask boldly because if we stand before you and believe that you will, you will come through. Yes, so come Lord. through tonight in the lives of these individuals. Come through tonight yes. in the life of this yes. church. Just come yes. through, Lord Jesus, and have your way. Yes. Well, this is our prayer, oh God. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Glory. Amen. Amen. We want to, yeah. We want to thank you guys too for the invitation is sending out and to keep us in your prayers as we travel out to Oklahoma. Amen. Tonight we are in Alabama. Okay. Amen. And we'll be in Memphis in a couple of days and mm -hmm. on to Oklahoma. All right. All right. Definitely, Amen. Definitely, Amen. Definitely, that's it. Guaranteed. Not a problem. Not a problem. Crazy. Yeah, just excited. I tell you, it was so good to see each and every one of you and our support yeah. of our new police chief, I tell you, oh, oh, you yes. <laughs> Amen, amen. He wasn't proud, I was proud. <laughs> so that was just awesome. And it's, it's just so good to see us coming together in so many aspects. And I just thank God for what he's done. I mean, he's just working amen. so much in the church and I just appreciate it, truly. Amen. I know he appreciated Pixie and Dixie. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I didn't know about that till that night. <laughs> so everyone take care. God bless. Again, Jackson, Hello. safe travels. We will definitely Amen. keep lifting in our prayers. So Amen. Cindy, we're always Amen. in our thoughts, lifting you Amen. up as well. For Clark, like I say, look for, remember, obviously we have our garage sale this, this uh, weekend and looking forward to uh, ministry on Sunday. Amen. 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 God bless each and every one. Have a good evening. Hello, 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 hey. Pamela.
Will do. Will yes, do. Thank you.